after all the acts that were today. Performance, uh, users of gifts and talents is for God. I think that's awesome. Uh, really appreciate all of that. I enjoyed it very much. And I know my wife did too. Uh, we're still in at, or I'm sorry, Luke this morning. Going, going to stay in Luke. And uh, Frank had read the scripture this morning that we're going to look at for just a brief time here this morning. And we're still going to talk about these guys. It's called the shepherds. Um, you know, it, we, we can't, we, you know how important the nativity scene is with Mary and, and Joseph and, and the wise guys that are, that are hanging around there. But uh, it's, it's always, I think, by far and away, one of the most popular parts of the nativity scene is, is the shepherds. Because where would we be without the shepherds? Uh, if you have your notes with you, um, I brought them a little bit late. Some of you may not have got them. But if you have your notes, point number one is... The shepherds receive news about the gift that still goes on. Uh, I think we would all find it extremely interesting, extremely interesting that God the Father used his chorus of angels to send maybe, probably, undoubtedly, the most important message to a group of people on this earth, which were the shepherds. The shepherds. In chapter 2, verse 8 of Luke, uh, it doesn't tell us much about who they are. There's no adjectives that are really used to describe them. It just says, and there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby. You notice living, okay? They weren't just, you know, doing an eight to five shift. These guys lived in the fields. And I think if we look back at our biblical history, we would agree that throughout the history of Israel, for out of its existence, that shepherding was really pretty, pretty much a noble profession. We look at some of the people that had that job over history, and uh, we see Abraham was a shepherd, Isaac was a shepherd, Jacob, Moses was a shepherd, and of course, young King David started out as a shepherd, didn't he? And even God calls himself a shepherd, and we're compared to sheep. Do you ever think about that? That we are compared to sheep. Did you ever wonder about that? I'll leave that for us to think about and wonder as to why the God sometimes referred to us as, as sheep. But shepherds at the time of Christ, the luster of that job that had when David and Abraham and Moses had it had kind of, had kind of been washed off. They, they weren't really very highly esteemed people at the time of Christ. As a matter of fact, at the time of Christ, shepherds were probably the lowest. They were probably the lowest class of people that there were. As a matter of fact, one reference I said, read said they came in just above the lepers. So, so I guess they weren't very highly esteemed at this time. And in order to understand, I think, how unusual that it was to have angels sent from heaven, angels, appear to these lowly shepherds, Let's learn just a little bit about them. Number one, letter A on your sheet. They were considered to be ceremonially unclean people. Because of the nature of their work, they were obviously not able to attend any type of religious services. They weren't able to go to the temple and worship God. Also, because of their duties, they were required, they were considered to be ceremonially unclean people. So others stayed away from them. Point number B is they were isolated and they were probably forgotten because their flocks needed to move around to find new grass, fresh water. They never stayed in one place very long. They were kind of nomads as they moved among the hills and the valleys to find food and water for the sheep. Letter C is I... My reading uncovered that they were often treated with contempt or mistrust. They were suspected of stealing from other people, and they would often confuse things that they may have thought of theirs uh, would actually belong to somebody else. And their testimony was not even permitted in court because they were considered to be untruthful men. So I think that says a lot about the shepherds. Whether they were guilty of these things or not, that's what people or society looked at them and considered them. And point number four about the shepherds is they were known to be brash and bold. They were known to be brash and bold men. 
They lived out in the fields away from society, and really that in itself made them unappealing to most people. And most of them, unfortunately, had picked up some, maybe some foul talk, foul language. They weren't the most, most uh, well-spoken men. And they were also known to pick a fight at the drop of a hat. So they were kind of ornery men. They were kind of ornery men at this time. But isn't it amazing that God entrusted his greatest message ever sent from heaven to a bunch of these smelly shepherds, these guys that probably hadn't had a bath in a long time. But you know, when we really think about it, it probably isn't so unusual, is it? Because God has always worked wonders for people that we would consider or the world might consider forgotten. God's always worked behind the scenes for those that are less, the lowly, those that may be despised in society. From the very beginning of time on this earth, Christ came to those who were humble, humble, and maybe felt of little value. You know, we remember Bible stories where Christ reached out to, to people like Zacchaeus and Levi, and there were, there were prostitutes involved and people that were demon-possessed, and there were strangers and there's even the hated Samaritans involved in this. And he did his ministry. He did his ministry, what the father did, in a borrowed stable. A borrowed stable. When there were lowly shepherds looking around, looking in at the Lord as cattle, cattle were hanging around outside. You know, Mary captured this in her song recorded in Luke 1, Luke 1, verse 52. She says, He has brought down rulers from their thrones, but has lifted up the humble. He chose the lowly things of this world and the despised things. Why did he do that? So that no one may boast before him. The shepherds help us see that God has a message today for sinners like us. Because everyone matters to God. And the only announcement of Christ's birth that goes out to a bunch of uneducated outcasts. As we briefly look at these shepherds' response, you know, I think it's important to see, just take a brief look and see how do these guys respond to this message. Well, number one, letter A, is they were attentive. They definitely were attentive. The first thing we see about the shepherds is they were very, very committed to their jobs, as we see in chapter 2, verse 8. It said, and there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks by night. They were so committed to their careers that they never left their work. They stayed there 24 hours a day, seven days a week. This was a full-time job for these guys. We see from this birth that they were, they, were, they were faithful people. Okay, They weren't ones that just talked the talk. They did what they were supposed to do. They stayed on the job. They were keeping watch, something that was very important. It was often the case that the different flocks would come together. Maybe different shepherds would bring their flocks together, and maybe they would somehow get them into a fold or into a, into a hillside. And it's said that the, that the shepherds would even sleep in a line in front of the opening to protect the sheep from predators that might come in at night. Notice that God came to those who were attentive at the jobs that they were given to do. They weren't, they weren't slackers, and he met them where they were. Letter B, they were awed. Okay, Have you ever been awed? You know, I'll never forget Colin Powell. Remember the first Gulf War when he said it's going to be shock and awe? Remember that? I'll never forget that when he said that. Because that's not, we use the word awesome, but have you ever been awed? While they were being attentive to the responsibilities that the shepherds have been given, they, they were suddenly awed. They were suddenly shocked. They were bewildered. They didn't know what to do in verse 9. It says, An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. Yeah, that would probably shake somebody up. You see an angel, a chorus of angels, speaking to these lowly shepherds in the middle of this field. Well, God meets us where we are. And often, sometimes when he does that, it might bring us to our knees. 
God's heavenly glory lights up the sky where these, where these uh, shepherds are, where they're working, and it causes them to quake in their sandals. They are scared. Whenever we come face to face sometimes with God's holiness, we fall apart under our sinfulness, don't we? Sometimes. And I wonder just when the last time is that you were in awe over a holy God and how he has worked in your life. Do you marvel this morning at the Messiah? Has it been a while since maybe you've hit your knees in awe of him? Let her see. The shepherds were accepted. They were accepted. The attentive shepherds, they were filled with awe. And now they accepted the message of the good news. They didn't reject it. They accepted it. In chapter 2, verses 10 through 15, But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. Isn't that something? How a lot of times we hear that. When angels appear, do not be afraid. Well, I would be afraid too. So I guess that's a, that's a good thing to say. Do not be afraid. I bring you good news. Good news of great joy that will be for all the people. Not just you. For everybody. Good news of acceptance. Good news of forgiveness and good news of hope for a better future. And the angel calms them down a little bit. And he tells them that he's bringing good news to them. The Greek word here for good news is mega. Mega, which means exceedingly huge, large, loud, and mighty. It's a superlative of the greatest degree. This message is for all the people. All the people. But I want you to notice the word is there, you. You. It was for them individually as well as it was for other people. It's for the whole world. But you know, this, this message must become deeply personal to every person. And after getting some more specifics, a whole regiment of rejoicing angels fills the sky praising God. And saying, glory to God in the highest and on earth Peace to men on whom his favor rests. That's good news. We know that they accepted this message because in verse 15 it says, let's go to Bethlehem. Let's go to Bethlehem and let's see. So in letter D, what did they do? They acted. They acted. These shepherds didn't just accept and enjoy the message. Oh, yes, this sounds so great. No, they acted upon it. Look at, look at verse 16. So they hurried off. This is the one thing that took them away from their job as shepherds. This is the one thing. They hurried off and they found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in a manger. You know, that's interesting, isn't it? Because the angel gives them specific instructions, doesn't he? He goes, go to Bethlehem and you will find the baby wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. Well, you know, there's a lot going on here. There's a lot of people here because they had this, this Roman census tax thing going on. So there's a bunch of people. There's even so many people that the motel was full. You know, they went in and looked for a room. No, sorry, all we got's the stable out back. Don't you believe that maybe among all these thousands and thousands of people, maybe there was another baby among this crew? Maybe somewhere there was another child that was wrapped in swaddling clothes? I wonder how the shepherds would make sure they found the right one. Well, out of all those babies that may have been there, how many do you suppose were laying in a manger? One. One. So that angel gave them specific instructions. You will find this baby wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. And you know another thing. You know, I, I remember briefly when uh, Prince Charles, I believe it was, uh, uh, or one of, these, one of his kids had a baby. It was been a couple years ago. You remember that? It, you know, the prince was born, and they had all this TV coverage, you know, 24-7 about this baby. And, and, you know, oh, it's been born. They were waiting patiently outside. There was thousands of Brits outside the Buckingham Palace waiting to hear news about this, uh, about this baby that was born. And then they had a guy come out and blow a trumpet, and he wrote the baby's name on a, on a big chalkboard. You know, it was, eh, it was a big announcement. Did you ever think of that compared to Christ, the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords? But you know what's really interesting about this is these shepherds. Let's just say that those guys had found a room in that inn. Let's say they had found a room. There were, well, we got one room left for Jesus to be born in. 
The shepherds probably couldn't even have gotten in. We're not letting you low life in here. You guys smell. They were, we're not going to let you in. God had this all planned out. He had it all planned out. They left and they shared. And they acted. The word hurried off means they left in haste. They dropped everything and they took off. The idea was to them, come on, hurry up, you guys, let's go. Letter E is they went and they saw. They went and they saw. They followed the instructions because they said, we want to see this for ourselves, and I can't blame them. The first thing they did was hurry and scurry off to Bethlehem. They wanted to see this baby with their own eyes. They wanted to see this baby that was born in this smelly stable with these animals all over and they wanted to maybe try to get away from the smell of sheep, but they found themselves right back in the middle of it. Check out the irony of this. Unclean shepherds come to a smelly stable to see the holy of holies lying on a bed of hay. And if you read many commentators about this particular situation, many believe that these shepherds were taking care of the sheep that were being raised and taken care of to be potential sacrifices at the temple. So they were very important. But isn't that an interesting connection between the sheep that would be sacrificed and they ran to visit in a stable with the same odors that they were used to and the same smells and the same circumstances and they looked at this baby, the Holy of Holies, who was also being raised to be a sacrifice for sin. Letter F. They left. They left and they shared. It's striking that they don't pull up a bale of straw and make themselves comfortable and have a chat. They didn't hang around the manger because they knew that they were now managers of the message. Kind of like what you had read. They knew that they were now managers of the message. The message that they shared had nothing to do with seeing the angels. And there's no reference to Mary's magnificence or what Job, Joseph did for a living or how wealthy he was or how poor he was. They came to see the baby. And now they head out to herald, to share, to shout the good news and to spread the word. In verse 17 it says, When, when they had seen him, not before. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child. And the word spread means to make known in such a way that people can understand. Make it known to all people in a way that everybody could understand. And we're here today. We are here today because thankfully those shepherds couldn't keep their mouth closed. Letter G. They adored. They adored. What's great here is the shepherds went back to their same boring jobs that they had before, standing around watching them sheep, but they were not the same men inside. They were not the same. They were never the same. They returned to where they started, and they were attentive again in their jobs. But notice that they didn't write a book. They didn't write a book, or they didn't go on a speaking tour, or they didn't launch a ministry called A Shepherd's Story. Now, after Christmas, all we have to do is go back to the same routine as before, but now, now we do it with rejoicing. Now we do it with rejoicing. We are to rejoice. We are to rejoice right everywhere we are. Yeah, it's possible to have joy in our jobs, no matter how yucky they are. And if we look at 220, it says, The shepherds returned glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and they had seen, which were just as they had been told. They don't just wonder about what they saw. They worship him as who they saw. Finally, the last line on your notes. A clear evidence then and a clear evidence today is adoration. Adoration. Someone has observed that many of us 
We worship our work. We worship our activities. We worship our stuff. We worship our play, and we, sometimes we play at our worship. But when a person is genuinely converted in the heart and the mind and the soul, he or she will praise God. Folks, I would ask that you would allow yourself this Advent season to adore, to adore this one called Emmanuel. And as you glorify and praise him for all that you have seen and all that you have heard this very day, you can return to the same place tomorrow, but never as the same person. Christmas is a real story. But folks, it has to become your story. It has to become your story. In verse 11, it says today. That, that means right now. In the town of David, a Savior, one who was born to pay the price for our sins, has been born to you personally. He has been born to you. He is the Christ. The Christ. The long-awaited Messiah. The Lord. He is your master. And he is your leader. And I would close with three questions this morning. Is he Savior to you? Is he Christ to you? And is he Lord to you? Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we celebrate this morning as a body of believers the birth, the coming birth of your Son, Jesus Christ. Lord, 2,000 years ago, you set this perfect plan in motion that only you could have come up with to save us, sinful people in desperate need of a Messiah, a desperate need of a Savior. Father, I just pray that we can focus upon this Savior, this season, and we can somehow, some way, we can put all the stuff and all the pomp and all the celebration maybe behind. And we can put you and we can elevate you, Father, to the top of our lives, to the top of our, our thought processes, to the thought of our hope, Father. And may we never, ever forget, never forget the greatest gift that we as individuals and mankind has ever received. We ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen.